from your professional perspective, can you talk to us a bit about how do you see modern movements now? I think this is coming at, at it as a restorer. I judge a quality watch probably by different standards to a lot of other people in that I judge it by how easy is it to take it apart, fix it and put it back together again. For me, when I look back on watches throughout history, the highest quality ones are the ones that are easiest to take apart and fix. He rediscovered his 1960s Rolex Oyster only yesterday. And I was trying to say to him last night, I really, really think you should probably get someone to look at that because we don't think it's been worn probably for 40 years. I kind of see with watches, especially with fine watches, treat them like you would do a beautiful classic car. You wouldn't want to just wear that into the ground. One of my favourite watches is the, the old Turner chronometer I have that my wife gave me um, and it was her grandfather's and he was very very into watch. He was an engineer by trade, he made his own car. Once One day every week I wear that Eterna chronometer from 1961 or whatever and really weirdly out of my collection of all the watches I've bought over the years, it's the only one my son wants to keep. When I started training as a watchmaker, one of my tutors told me that watches and clocks are among the most efficient machines ever invented. And he asked us to come up with other examples we could name that could run day and night for 30, 40 years with minimal human intervention and still be running. We can't not touch on the PhD because to the best of my knowledge, are you still the only person in the United Kingdom with one? Uh, only watchmaker with a PhD in horology. Unfortunately, which I would love to see change. So if anyone's listening to this and fancies giving it a go, I'd love to help and introduce you to some people and make it happen. Hi everybody, welcome to the Watch Gecko YouTube channel with myself, Richard. As you can see, we're coming from the bunker here because I couldn't make it into the office today. Now, as you know, we've done a series of interviews with CEOs and influential people in the watch industry, and we're very lucky today to have a special guest. I would like to introduce, please, Dr. Rebecca Struthers. Rebecca, welcome to the Watch Gecko YouTube channel. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to have you here. Now, um, we've been following you very closely, and your uh, your prowess and your the, the, what you're achieving here in the world of horology is absolutely incredible. But I have a burning question to ask you is, do you like to be called Dr. Struthers? Um, <laughs> uh, usually people only call me Dr. Struthers when they want something. It's a bit like when my husband calls me Rebecca. It's either that or I'm in trouble. So you're okay with just Rebecca. <laughs> we'll stick with Rebecca then. Okay. Yeah. Um, in all seriousness, looking at your website and what you're trying to achieve here and the beautiful creations that you're making, um, it's so wonderful to see um, this hailing from the United Kingdom as well. I hate to use the J word, the journey word, but can you talk to us, please, about how you started from, I think it was about the age of 17, and take us up to the PhD? How did you, you get onto this path? Yeah, um, I'm a high school dropout. So, um, yeah, I, I had a hard time at school. Um, so I've always loved both art and science. And at school, they really taught us very separate subjects. Um, so yeah, I, I struggled and I, I left. It wasn't working for me. Um, and it just so happened that I grew up down the road from a school of jewelry and silversmithing. Um, so I, I went there and kind of fell in love with the building, I suppose. And yeah, started studying jewelry and silversmithing. So that was my first two years. Um, that was BTEC National and very hands-on. So proper foundation skills of how to use a file, how to use a saw, that kind of thing. And um, it was while I was there, I got sort of developed an interest in uh, making things and moving parts yeah off the back of that my work was spotted by some of the watchmaking students and it was pure coincidence that watchmaking happened to be taught at the same university um and they saw my work at a show and one of them including my now husband craig came over and asked if i'd ever thought about trying watchmaking um and at that point the honest answer was no i i didn't know it was a career i didn't know it was even a thing, let alone how huge the industry was. And um, they invited me to their workshop. So I went up and um, I had a look around and I was just like, wow, this is this is it. This is what I want to do in my life. So after I finished that two-year course, I switched on to uh, watchmaking for three years. And that was the start of, well, I spent about 13 years at uni in the end. <laughs> Unlucky for some. Um, yeah, around uh, work the whole time as well. Yeah. And did, I mean, it's fair to say probably at this point you didn't have a passion for the industry because you said you're so new to it. When did you feel this was 
when did the passion appear? Because that's what I think comes over so much in the way you your designs and what you've written. And of course, we'll touch on your book later. When did the passion really come into it? Um, I mean, the passion itself was the minute I set foot in that workshop and just realised that you could be an artist and a designer and an engineer and a physicist all in one job description and that was um that was like a real epiphany moment for me um even at that point I didn't realize how huge the industry was and how what I would end up doing none of this was a grand plan it's all been quite reactionary really of me kind of Mm. being presented with opportunities or or seeing a chance to do something and thinking yeah that looks exciting but uh, as for the subject itself I love being a watchmaker i can't think of anything else i'd want to do with my life well I, I think that's wonderful i think most of us who own various products can only boggle at the complexity of the inside it i'm wearing an omega Speedmaster at the moment and when you look at the movement through a crystal case bag it's it, even to me who's been into watches for as long as i can remember it seems almost incomprehensible that it could be created by a person so for what you do to create it from scratch is, is really quite special I mean, it still blows my mind. I work with a lot of historic stuff too. And when you're dealing with things that are two, three, four hundred years old and thinking, they made this without, before we'd harness electricity for motors or lights, you know, it's, it still blows my mind. I think every day, no matter how many times I do it and take apart watches, the, just the sheer human ingenuity of them is, yeah, I don't think that'll ever get old. Whilst I, I want to perhaps stay away from the Swiss giants, I don't know if you remember, there was a an advert that Omega did once, which I always love. And do you know the one I'm going to mention? It was it, it starts off with some uh, a girl swimming, then there's an Aston Martin, then there's an Apollo scene. And the whole advert is an animation made out of watch parts. Yeah. And, and yeah. I always, I thought it was beautiful they did that because they were also obviously recognizing because there is this beauty inside them and i always find it really interesting that you know you uh i mean let's take another giant rolex for example you know they've only just at watches and wonders introduced their first crystal case back um this is actually a debate craig and i had when we first started designing our watches that he wanted a a solid case back and i wanted a crystal case back and that's why the first ones of our our tailor-made watches where we used recommissioned heritage calibers had both so we had a hinged solid outer back with an inner inspection crystal um because his attitude was one of like we see movements all the time it's done like no one needs to see that um Although we, I mean, we still finished things to a very high standard, but um, yeah, because he, he did it every day, and I was saying to him, "No, that's because you do it every day. To you, it's normal. <laughs> to you, you expect it." But most people really want to see that bit of it, and this was our compromise. But now we just do crystal backs because he's finally agreed with me that I'm right. He knows what's good for him. <laughs> Doctor Struthers cut. Doctor Struthers <laughs> yeah. cut in, did she? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of the things I was really intrigued in when I was doing some uh, research before we spoke today was um, you make many references to British watchmaking. Now, I'm fascinated by this. Do you differentiate that then from, say, American, German or Swiss? Only in terms of its kind of period within history. So uh, watchmaking emerges out of kind of South Germany and Northern Italy. Um, then you kind of get into the era of the golden age of British watchmaking and then Swiss and American leading out into Swiss. So in terms of the um, sort of designs and styles that were going on, they were very much led by their era and by era it kind of falls into national categories. Um, in terms of how we seek our inspiration for what we do, we're really international. Um, our first watch, uh, fully in-house watch, Project 248, um, that has taken inspiration from watchmakers all over the world. We've got German silver, Brego parachute shock settings, Daniel style balance, uh, rocking bar keyless work like Derek Pratt's. Um, yeah, we uh, kind of cherry pick the stuff we love the most, which is very international. It's interesting because I, I've <clears throat> in the family we have a, a Waltham pocket watch, which requires a little bit of attention. And it was my great great grandfather brought it back from America. Mm. And I, don't, I, I was I was one I was just from a very personal perspective I wanted to ask you is that would you judge that as a quintessentially American watch in any way? Yeah, I mean we're big fans of American watchmaking too. But yeah, your Waltham Elgin Hamilton kind of era of watchmaking that some incredible stuff being made that was some of it on a par with what was being made in Switzerland as high end level. 
Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, the PhD. We can't not touch on the PhD because, to the best of my knowledge, are you still the only person in the United Kingdom with one? Uh, only watchmaker with a PhD in horology. Unfortunately, which I would love to see change. So if anyone's listening to this and fancies giving it a go, I'd love to help and introduce you to some people and make it happen. What, what did you need to do to then? To, because obviously you must have the drive for you to make that happen is obviously, it, it must have been, again, a journey in itself. What did you do to, to, to achieve that? Um, I started off with a master's degree, so yeah, like I said, I was 13 years of uni, pretty much. Um, I did a master's degree in history of art and design because there's no higher degree um, in horology in the UK. We've got a bachelor's degree, but nothing above that. Um, so I did one in history of art and design that I tailored to be about watchmaking. Because history of design is quite easy to lead into watchmaking. Um, and then off the back of that, um, again, I'd, I'd not really thought about doing a PhD. I was the first person in my direct family to go to university at all. So it wasn't really on my radar as something that people like me would do. Um, but the research I'd done for my master's was picked up by um, one of the research directors at my university who asked if I'd considered it and would like to go for a grant um, to fund it. And I thought, oh, that would be really cool because I, I love the subject I was working on at the time. I really wanted to take it further. So I did and somehow managed to get the grant <laughs> um, and that funded the, the three years full-time PhD, which I did around running a business full-time, which is fun. Not much sleep for three years, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, plenty of people will identify with that one. I, 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 I agree wholeheartedly with you. I mean, you can get PhDs in motor mechanics, gunsmithing, whatever. I mean, I, I don't know why it's not, as a subject, it's not more prevalent because there are i mean we have i'm reliably in told 110,000 people a month read our magazine there's plenty of people interested in it but it just doesn't maybe yeah. occur to people to study it well there are more opportunities in researching time itself um some really exciting research going on that in that field at the moment um but practitioners researching watchmaking is I don't understand why it's so unusual because for me, it's a really natural combination of the two. You get restoration is in part research because you've got to research the object you're working on. So you've got to understand the history of something that's 200 years old to put it back to being right again. Um, and also, if you're going to understand the full kind of 360 degree um, three dimensional view of an object then you need to be able to take it apart and examine it and you can only do that as a watchmaker so that very much informs my research i'm very hands-on in what i do i straight watches down i study them forensically sometimes um uh, my phd included things like x-ray and xrs scanning of watches um and taking apart 30 of them to look for hidden messages marks meanings uh, manufacturing techniques anything i could see inside the movement to give away who was making and where they were made and how they're being shipped around the world um which you can only do that as a watchmaker so i don't understand why more watchmakers don't do it and why more researchers don't recruit watchmakers to help i agree let's 14 27 25th of april <laughs> Yeah. We're with you. We'll make it happen. I want to touch, you briefly mentioned about the study of time, but I'll, I'll we'll talk about that in a wee bit if that's okay, because it's something that I'm quite interested in, because I do believe, and I can, can, I can almost hear some of our regular viewers twitching a bit here. I do believe there's this kind of spiritual element to watches a little bit. I, I They're more than the sum of their parts, I think is what I'm saying, to me personally. That's why we yeah. do what we do. We love it. Um, but keeping with the here and now, before we go into your book, Tell me, please, about Stella. Stella, our first ever watch. So this was, um, we started our first workshop just as restorers. That's what we were doing. Um, but Craig had historically done illustration in the past. And I obviously had done the jewellery and silversmithing. So we're both quite creative. And we saw a design competition come up uh, with a call for entries. And you had to design a piece of jewellery where platinum was the hero of the piece. Um, and we decided to design a pendant watch um, where we'd rebuild the rotary in platinum, so it'd be platinum round, and it'd be mounted in a gimbal. So as you wore the watch, the whole thing would spin, and that would be what allowed it to wind rather than being worn on the wrist. So we did this design and um, submitted it and won, which was really exciting initially. And then we realised that we got... Um, 
10 weeks to now make the wash for a big show <laughs> so the excitement Oops. quickly wore off um yeah. and th that was the start of our journey of making our first watch and when we recovered from that we realized actually not only did we quite enjoy it but we knew we could do better and do more and this is something we wanted to pursue and everything else grew out of that so just in case people aren't you know necessarily haven't clocked onto your website yet can you just tell us is, is Stella a one-off or was there a few Stellas? No, Stella was a one-off, um, completely unique piece. Wow. And where is Stella now? Um, she, we still have her. <laughs> Excellent. Good. <laughs> I was hoping her. you were going to say that. That's yeah. really good. Now, uh, looking at your current portfolio, um, I, I was delighted to see the first thing that popped up was a pocket watch because they are there's a, there's a certain coolness I think we've lost about them a little bit, um, which is your Carter. Um, yes. what's it, what, what's the inspiration for the name and tell, tell us just a little bit about Carter, please. So each of our three tailor-made watches, um, are named after the first client to have commissioned one. And this is when we were moving out of, um, initially we started doing one-off pieces like Stella that were completely bespoke, worldwide unique, um, one at a time sort of watches. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is a great way of building your reputation and showing what you can do, but it's also a terrible way of trying to run a business because um, <laughs> you can never make back <laughs> your research and development. So we thought, okay, with the next ones we do, we're going to ask the client if we'd be happy, if they would be happy for us to make more of these watches and we'll name the watch after them. And um, they agreed. And so we have uh, the Kingsley, the Kelso and the Carter after Mr. Carter, Mr. Kingsley and Mrs. Kelso. Um, those are now our three kind of staple tailor-made watches and that range will remain the same. So these are designs that the clients actually asked for rather than you created? A bit of both. Um, we work very closely with our clients, so it's not total free reign. Um, we have ideas that we want that we kind of present to them and work within that. I was just wondering, is it, I mean, I if, if I was designing the, the Richard, probably say that was your next watch, <laughs> uh, um, it must be quite difficult to balance client expectations with what's possible. Uh, the collaborative process to begin with must be fascinating. Let's just say, for example, um, we were going to make, I, I've approached you and said, I'd like to make the Richard. What, what's the first questions you'd ask me? Um, well, now we don't make completely bespoke at all. So it'd be within one of those tailored ranges. That's something we learned quite early on because that creates immediately you've got a structure and a skeleton in place that you can work to. Um, and then from there, it'd be things like choices around gold color, dial designs. We do a lot of different dial variations. Um, and although they're not supposed to be unique pieces, they usually end up, end up being unique pieces because yeah. we just love a challenge. So people come to us with all sorts of things. And we, we always try and work it in. It might not be in full the way they were thinking, but we'll tailor it to what we know works well and also who we work with. So we work with some incredible artisans and we like to kind of push their boundaries a bit as well, as I hope they do with us. And we can bring that in for our clients too. So if they have one idea and I'm thinking, oh, that I'm not entirely sure that's going to look the way you want it to but I've got this idea here and I can bring in something new. That's mm -hmm. usually how we work it, yeah. Okay, that sounds like a really intriguing process. And I think we, we, could, we could do a conversation just on that alone. But moving on, I'm intrigued by, it sounds awfully technical. It does sound like something from NASA, Project 248. <laughs> it's uh, the opposite of something from NASA. So Project 248 was nicknamed after two watchmakers, four hands and a traditional eight millimeter lathe which is how we've made pretty much all of the watch. So and all of the all of the components, the case, the dial, um, we make the Blankov and it's an amulet by Anordain up in Glasgow. Um, so they've been really good to work with. But other than springs and jewels, that's, that's it. We've uh, made everything ourselves. 248 is going into what? A wristwatch. So the, yeah, the yeah. first ones of those That's... were five wristwatches. And then going forward, we're making one at a time, one after the other. Right. So, yeah, there'll never be more than 15 Project 248 wristwatches. Okay. And have you won the crystal case back debate? Yes, I have won the crystal case back debate. <laughs> Proud to say. <laughs> Good job. So talking of 
movements um and perhaps i mean i don't know this may be something that will make you slightly recoil in horror or you'll be m more accommodating i don't know uh, modern movements we, we've just obviously as you can imagine we've spent the last couple of weeks covering watches and wonders which mario and another colleague of mine went to um in-house movements or the in thing um we're being tempted with ever more complex movements from chronometers to master chronometers to cosc certified which is now so yesterday it's now somebody else is certified from your professional perspective can you talk to us a bit about how, how do you see modern movements now um, they vary hugely, don't they? I mean, you get some really beautiful, high-end, beautifully made, beautifully finished things, and then you get things that aren't quite like that. And it depends on the end of the market and what it is that the watch is ultimately seeking to achieve, I think. Um, you need room for a bit of everything. And for me, again, I think this is coming at, at it as a restorer. I judge a quality watch probably by different standards to a lot of other people in that I judge it by how easy is it to take it apart, fix it and put it back together again. That for me, when I look back on watches throughout history, the highest quality ones are the ones that are easiest to take apart and fix. Um, so sometimes if I see kind of the very high end expensive watches and I'm looking at the movement thinking, oh, I would not want to be the watchmaker working on that in 30, 40 years' time. That's going to be a nightmare. Um, wow. That's when I think of it like, okay, that's a lot of money for something that's going to be really hard to maintain. Um, but again, for like your kind of cheap and cheerful watches, you, things have to be done at a price point to make them accessible. And they're not always the easiest to repair either, but you can move and exchange them, which might not be great for the environment, but uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no. I, it's, it's just interesting, you know. We, we were just writing about um, uh, one of the um, Omega movements this morning in a separate feature, and and I was trying to digest the master chronometer concept um, as opposed to the certified chronometer, which we have. And uh, I mean, it's 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 adding thousands of pounds to the watch. It's it's it it seems to look beautiful when you get these wonderful three dimensional sort of CGIs that come out from Omega and. Um, I I just wonder is it a is it a step too far or is it the future? I, I really genuinely don't know. Have you any thoughts? Um, I'm not familiar with that one, but um, because I, everything I do is very historic, I'm more on the old side of things. But the notion of brands coming up with a new um next best thing that will be the future has uh, been around for probably the last hundred years, um, <laughs> probably more than that. So I mean, it, it's no new thing. This kind of constantly trying to be the best, first, newest, most exciting future of, and um, some things catch on and some things don't. Um, so yeah, only time will tell. Okay, going back then, let's let's go back 20, 30, 40 years or whatever, because it's something that's of interest to me, is that uh, I wanted to ask you about servicing. Mm -hmm. Because I had a good friend who didn't believe in it until his Breitling died. And I, I've always done it with my Rolex and other things that I own. If you could pass on a, a message to our audience, I, I'm guessing you're very pro-servicing. Yeah, I mean, certainly for vintage watches, if you're wearing them regularly, every three to five years, usually, that's what you should be going for. My friend, uh, one of my friends and colleagues, who would, uh, you will see on the video channel, Anthony, he um, rediscovered his 1960s Rolex Oyster only yesterday. And we've restrapped it. And I was trying to say to him last night, I really, really think you should probably get someone to look at that because we don't think it's been worn probably for 40 years. I mean, what what will that actually? I'm asking you this as a horologist now, as a, as an interested guy. What would that have done to a, mech, a movement? Yeah, I mean, firstly, I'll just say this is one of the wonderful things about watches, and one of the reasons I still fascinate and leave me in awe to this day is that uh, when I started training as a watchmaker, one of my tutors told me that watches and clocks are among the most efficient machines ever invented. And he asked us to come up with other examples we could name that could run day and night for 30, 40 years with minimal human intervention and still be running. And he's, he's right. He's right. Beyond winding them, I can't think of a car that would run for that long um, without needing a service or an oil change. 
Um, yeah, they're incredible, incredible machines. That said, I'm not encouraging it. <laughs> so just because right. they can doesn't mean we should. So yeah. oils dry up. And if there's any dirt or debris that's managed to get inside the case, that can end up in, in jewel holes and start wearing at pivots, wearing at parts. And the longer you wear it whilst it's dirty or has dry oils in it, the more wear you're doing. And that in turn is increasing the risk that you're going to need parts replacing, which is making it more expensive and risks the originality of the watch. So it's not wise. Just because it can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> right. So the messages do get it done, especially if you've spent umpteen thousand pound on a watch um, years ago it's 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 prudent to look after it for sure yeah i think that's where a lot of the kind of complaints about cost of servicing comes up as well as if you're not doing it regularly and then kind of 15 years later you book it in for a service you are going to pay more because you're going to have parts that need replacing now um so it's gonna it, it'll just make a bigger bill down the road back to the car analogy I suppose isn't it if you only get it done every five years you're going to need a new engine yeah, yeah I, I kind of see with watches, especially with fine watches, treat them like you would do a beautiful classic car. You wouldn't want to just wear that into the ground and never get it checked over, never check the oil, never check the tyres. You look after it. And the same with a classic watch, a beautiful piece of vintage mechanics. You want to look after it, take care of it. Taking it to your watchmaker is like taking it to the garage to give it a spring clean once over. I can assure you, I think most of our audience do do it because we do regularly get people telling us how expensive the servicing was. Um, yeah. You've just published a book. Uh, well, it's not just published, but you have published a book, uh, which I have read stellar reviews, oh, no pun intended, stellar reviews of in various newspapers and publications. Um, from what I've seen of it, because you very kindly zipped Mario a PDF. I've really loved the spiritual side of it, and I'm using that term with huge caution. Uh, I'm not saying this is some weird trip about watches. It's the fact that you're trying to tell us that they're more than the sum of their parts, if I've read it correctly. Talk to us yeah. a little bit about the book, please. So it, the book is a history of time told through some of the ingenious objects that we've invented to measure it, and all through my kind of hands and eyes at the bench as a, a watchmaker so i look at some of the amazing watches i've handled over the years and and study them like like i do with my research study them to see what they can tell us about ourselves at that point our wider relationship with time how they were being worn uh the sort of people who were making them and what they were like yeah so it's kind of a bit of an adventure story really back through objects and i start forty thousand years ago in time at how we first possibly discovered the cyclic nature of time and started to measure it you can't leave me hanging on that one <laughs> <laughs> i can keep I, going i can <laughs> no please keep going i can keep going you, um, you, I t let's you could just read the book we'll do a regular regular yeah. series <laughs> yeah do a series um yeah so in terms of a watch being more than the sum of its parts they are incredibly culturally significant things they're very socially significant to us as well everything we think of that we're able to do today in terms of work trade travel transport all relies on uh, access to accurate timekeeping which all comes through the invention of the first clocks and then watches so they're really really socially important things and also human made which is another thing that i really love and this almost you talk about a spirit in it i talk about um it's, i personally have no religion and i see my the watches that i make as being like my little mechanical ghosts that i leave on the earth that will carry on running behind me so it's the closest thing that i have to leaving behind that lasting part of myself and who i am and i know when i design watches that i design them in ways that they don't have to be with details they don't need because i want to because that's me and because that's my personality and my character coming through in what i make and i think all watchmakers are, are like that i think that's that's lovely i mean i i completely agree with you i think that i always one of my favorite watches is the the old um eterna chronometer i have that my wife gave me um, and it was her grandfather's. And he was very, very into watches. He was an engineer by trade. He made his own car. And I I never met the man. But I can only hope that he would be thrilled that I've got his watch. And I wear it every day. And I've had it serviced by the local guy in the local town. And 
I've put it onto a beautiful new strap and embraced it. And it's every day, once one day every week, I wear that Eterna chronometer from 1961 mm. or whatever. And really weirdly, out of my collection of all the watches I've bought over the years, it's the only one my son wants to keep. And I oh, think that's, that's I think that's the magic of it. And yeah. through the three generations that watch is kept alive, both kind of emotionally and mechanically. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a beautiful thing. They are, are almost like a bridge to the past, aren't they? Because there's something mm. that is kept in such close proximity to the body that we remember our relative wearing them and carrying it with them every single day. And then when we do inherit these things, it is such a close part there aren't many other like, I items of clothing that you could continue wearing the same way really other than jewelry there um there yeah watches are that yeah and they're they're symbols of time in themselves which i think adds that extra level of poignance to them is that it's a symbol of time that reminds us of a moment in time and is a very close connection to the person it reminds us of it is a huge connection i, I mean mm. uh, one of the uh, my one of my great passions in life is the apollo missions and um which you can't see but there's an entire wall to the right of me devoted to it here and cool. <laughs> um, i remember the first time i saw the speedmasters in the smithsonian that um mm. collins and i can't which other alan bean one a few of the astronauts had and that was not looking at an omega speedmaster because when i looked at the dial of that watch i was thinking to myself oh my goodness alan bean looked at the dial of that watch when he was on the moon that yeah. you know he would glance at the watch glance over it and is seeing something that i can only dream of and somehow yeah. again it, the watch becomes part of that yeah absolutely you think about the what these things have overheard whether it's tucked in someone's pocket or under their shirt on their wrist you yeah. think of the things it's eavesdropped on and, and decisions it's been present to it's um gives you goosebumps really <laughs> It does. One of the other things that really intrigued me in some of your writing as well was when you, you, you briefly touched on it there was the the impact it had on a certain generation of people. And I look at, say, for example, the clock tower, which is in our village. And I think when that clock tower was erected, life in the village fundamentally changed. People didn't have watches, but suddenly they could be late for something now. Yeah, and it also gives the community a sense of shared time as well. So instead of everyone on their own doing their own thing, working to their own schedule, obviously would would have always had some kind of awareness because of things like the position of the sun. But having a clock to impose it for you brings everyone together at specific times. And certainly you think about early markets, you think about things like trading on a on a Wednesday or on a Saturday of getting together at the market at the right time to do business and buy your food for the week. Um, I think clocks were a fundamental part of that, bringing together groups of people to work to a, the same schedule. It's wonderful. Well, talking about community, um, I'd like to touch, please, if I can, on the Watchmakers Cafe. Yeah, so this was what an incentive. A concept. It, yeah, thank you. Um, it's a great concept other than I'm struggling with time <laughs> to get everything up and off the ground. So we've uh, got all the websites pretty much there in the background and I very gratefully got someone on board to help me out with this, another watchmaker. And this is our way of giving back. Um, so we had an experience with an apprentice a few years ago and found that, I mean, we can completely understand the struggles of people trying to hire apprentices because if there's only one or two of you in the business, the time that you're teaching them is time that you're not working. You can get grants to kind of help-ish with some of their wages, not all of their wages, but nothing will um, cover your lost wages while you're not working. And certainly nothing will help you out with your clients when they're chasing you for their work <laughs> and you haven't had time to get their work done for them because you're busy teaching someone. So it is a real struggle, but we do we are so short on watchmakers in the UK, especially restorers and um we really want to encourage more people to do that. We know how solitary it can be as a profession too. If you're on your own and you're struggling with something, you've got no one to ask for advice. So the Watchmakers Cafe came out of that idea um, of creating kind of a community space where people can come together no matter what level of their career they're at, whether they're just thinking of becoming a watchmaker right the way through to being an experienced watchmaker, Um to yeah, share any challenges. Um, we're sharing everything from all our material suppliers, parts suppliers, um, yeah, where where how we do what we do, um, to hopefully encourage more people to 
pursue it as a as a career i hope um we'll see so how can people become interactive with the cafe i mean obviously we can punch up a link to the website that can flash up automatically that's not a problem yeah well i've got to set it to live will be the the moment of truth now so that's coming soon now uh, the other thing we're doing is uh, Craig did a scholarship in watch case making, traditional watch case making. So that's making precious metal watch cases out of sheet and bar metal. And we're sharing all of his um, bench notes for that. So there'll be a full kind of breakdown on this is how you make a watch case. He's the last full time specialist watch case maker in the UK died a few years ago. And the only watchmakers I now know of doing it are watchmakers who also do case making. I don't know anyone who's a specialist case maker. Um, so those are really rare skills. Again, all this will be free to use as well. So as soon as the website's live, people will be able to log in, no cost at all, and interact with us, read any articles we've posted. Um, the British Horological Institute have kindly offered to share some of their course notes as well. So if anyone's just starting out and thinking, you know, do I want to go as far as taking a course? What's it like? They'll be able to access some um, sample material from that to get a bit of a feel of, of what's involved um, and ask the community questions, um, get feedback from anyone else who's done courses or, yeah, so that's another thing. We're very short on courses in the UK and unless you're able to move to be attending one of them, it's kind of you can't you can't get to it. So if people have got family or reasons they can't just up sticks and go, or or they need the money from their job, you know, it means that they can't pursue a career. And I don't think that's the way to get more people into this. I think we need accessibility above all. Well, it sounds like an amazing resource, and I mean, all we can do is wish you well with it. Uh, I really hope it gets up and running because, as you're right, it's sadly lacking, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. And like, if anyone hears this and wants to help out too, if they want to share any articles or anything, I'm, I need I need help. <laughs> you heard so, it yeah, here, people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. we we will rally the community, the Watch Gecko community. I'm sure yeah. there will be somebody out there who wants to help. Uh, what's What's next for Struthers Watchmakers then? What, what's What's What does the rest of 2023 hold for you? Um, well, we are obviously the book is a huge thing. Um, we're finishing off the first round of those five two four eights, um, and starting the next ones. We're also starting a triple calendar version of the Kingsley, so that won't be finished this year, but it'll be started this year. So that is more than enough work for two people and the Watchmakers Cafe. This is why I need help. There's only one of me. So if anyone knows anything about cloning, that could be another opportunity. <laughs> um, I I don't think even the the Star Wars stuff behind me is going to help you on the cloning front. <laughs> it's probably for the best, to be fair. <laughs> one of me is enough. <laughs> oh, don't drag me into that one. <laughs> um, Rebecca, it's been lovely chatting to you. I would um, very much like to do this again at some point, if you're happy, especially when yeah. you have new developments. Um, sure. I'd very much like the Watch Gecko community to be kept up to speed, if we can, please, with the Watch uh, Makers Cafe. I think that would be something that will really fascinate them. Um, so all that remains for me to do is thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Rebecca Struthers. Thank you for giving us a little bit of your <laughs> afternoon. Cool. And no, um, we really wish you well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And on that, uh, on that note, we'll leave. Thank you again for watching. This is the Watch Gecko YouTube channel. I'm Richard. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to the magazine, the YouTube channel, and keep an eye out for us on social media. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye.